Thank you, Radu, for that time of prayer. It was, um, was really beautiful. Um, how are you guys doing? I'm sorry, I can't hear you guys. How are you guys doing? God is good. And all the time. Amen. Uh, we thank God for giving us this chance and this opportunity to have fellowship with each other and to have fellowship with God. Um, today I'm going to be sharing the word of you guys, the word of God with you guys. I'm only going to take a um, little bit of your time. I'm only going to take two hours. Uh, no? <laughs> okay. Um, but I'm not going to take two hours, don't worry, but I'm going to be sharing the word of God with you guys. Um, so can we turn our Bibles to Galatians chapter 3? verse 24 and 25. So that's Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 and 25. And it says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Let's pray. So, Lord, we just want to thank you. We want to honor you. We want to praise your name on this day. And, Lord, at this time, we just ask that you reveal your word to us, Lord. I pray that you use me as a vessel to teach us whatever it is that you want to teach us on this day, Lord. I pray that you have your way. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, a few weeks back in Bible study, we were studying uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And one verse that really uh, stood out for me is uh, verse 15, which says, I was, and it was Paul talking to Timothy, and it says, And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, a statement that we usually hear and a statement that we usually say is, you know, um, the Old Testament, it points to Christ, but... As Christians, I feel like we tend to focus more on how to apply those specific passages in the Old Testament directly to our lives instead of actually trying to see how it reveals Christ or how it talks about God's character. Um, and But like if we actually look at this verse, it says the, old, the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures here refers to the Old Testament it, and the Old Testament is able to make you wise unto salvation, which is in Christ Jesus. And even the verse I mentioned earlier, uh, when we're talking about Galatians 3, it says the law was the tutor that, uh, sorry, the law was the tutor that brought us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So from these two verses, we can understand that the Old Testament is, uh, reveals Christ, or it actually brings us to Christ. And if you actually think about it, when we're talking about the New Testament, a lot of things in the New Testament would not make any sense if you don't understand the Old Testament. Like, for example, um, when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who, took, who takes the sin of the world. Now, if you actually hear that without understanding the Old Testament, then that statement would not make any sense. That's why we need to have a good understanding of the Old Testament. Um, one such book that is very important is uh, the book of Leviticus. And it's a book that I'm going to be covering today. Um, so the topic for today is Jesus Christ and the Old Testament sacrifices. And we're going to see how the different sacrifices actually reveal Christ. Um, so when we're talking about the book of Leviticus, it was written by Moses in 1444 B.C., um, it was written one year after uh, the Israelites left Egypt. And the book of Leviticus is basically a manual or an instruction of how people were supposed to um, perform these different sacrifices, these different offerings. Um, and it also talks about how God is holy and how he expects his people to be holy. It also talks about how they were um, supposed to like live, like for example, how what what type of things they were supposed to eat and um, other things. But like today, I'm going to be talking about how the different offerings actually reveal Christ. So um, let's go to Leviticus chapter one. Leviticus chapter one. Um, so when we're talking about the Leviticus, um, the book covers six different offerings those are the burnt offering the grain offering or the meal offering the peace offering the sin offering the trespass or the guilt offering and also the consecration or the ordination offering which is only for the priests uh, but today uh, i'm just going to be covering the burnt offering and the peace offering so the burnt offering is found in uh, leviticus chapter one 
And I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 5. And it says, Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you bring an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He, he shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before the Lord, and the priests Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle. So, um, like, we can continue, and it's going to tell you guys about how the, the, how the sacrifice happened. So, in the burnt offering, there were certain criteria that they had to satisfy. One is the animal, it was supposed to be an animal from a herd. It was uh, supposed to be a, a bull, a sheep, a goat, or if the person was poor, they could actually offer a bird. Um, another thing is, the, like, the sacrifice was supposed to be male, and it was supposed to be without blemish. Uh, and when the person was offering the sacrifice, they were supposed to put their hands on the animal, basically identifying themselves. Um, and when they killed, I'm sorry, and it was the person would kill the bull and then um, the priest would sprinkle the blood on the altar and then the skin of the animal is removed and it's given to the, given to the priest. And then the body of the animal is cut up into pieces and it was basically burnt. Now, like, we're going to see how the different elements in this burnt offering actually reveal Christ or how, how they have been satisfied by Christ. So when we start from verse 1, it says, Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting. So the tabernacle was basically a tent-like structure. It only had one door to go to get in and out of the, or out of the, uh, the tabernacle. And then... Um, when we're talking about the tabernacle, it was the place where the people would actually uh, offer their sacrifices. And it was how, um, and it was like a place where they would actually have access to God, where they have fellowship with God. Because even here it says, God spoke to Moses in, in the tabernacle. So how Jesus Christ actually satisfies the tabernacle is the same way that there was only one door into the tabernacle. The same way that they were having access to God. Jesus, like when we're talking about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ in the New Testament tells us that he is the door, right? And you can get salvation if you go through the door. And it also says that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through him. It's only through God that you can have access to, it's only through Christ that you can have access to God. And here, like in the tabernacle, it was the one door, one doorway that they could access, like they can have fellowship with God, basically. Um... So that's verse 1. And when we go to um, verse 3, it says, If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle meet of meeting before the Lord. And he shall put his hand on the head of the, of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. So what was happening here is the person would the person that's offering they would put their hands on the animal like the, the animal that we're going to sacrifice basically identifying themselves. So what's happening here is they, they were offering an animal that was without blemish. So the perfect the one without blemish was dying for the one that was defective, the one that was imperfect, the one with blemish, right? And another thing is the person was putting their hands on the animal, so they're identifying themselves. So when we talk about atonement, atonement basically, when we look at the Hebrew word, it means to cover for. So the animal was basically sacrificed to cover for the sin of uh, the, anim the, the animal. Not a specific sin, but it was supposed to like atone for the sin of the person. So how I, I think this is obvious uh, how it um, how it represents Christ. But let's go to First um, Peter chapter three, uh, verse eighteen. Um, first chap First Peter chapter three, verse eighteen, and it says, "For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God." being put to death in this flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So Christ suffered once for sins. They were supposed to make the burnt sacrifice frequently, 
but Christ just entered once. He suffered once for our sins, right? The just for the unjust. Jesus Christ was the, the, was the lamp without blemish. He was um, perfect. He had no sin. Like he lived in this earth for more than 30 years. And then he was the lamb without blemish. There wasn't even one deceit in his mouth. He was the perfect sacrifice. He died for the unjust, for the imperfect, for the ones with blemish. So he might bring us to God. So when we're talking about the burnt offering, it was a, a way for them to be right with God, right? So, um, and when Jesus Christ died for our sins, he brought us to God. Through him, now we can have access to God. Not only are we justified, but he brought us to God. And we'll cover this more on uh, the peace offering. Um, and then when we're looking at verse 3, again, when you look at verse 3, it says, If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. The door of the tabernacle of meeting. Sorry. Um, door of the tabernacle of meeting. So what was happening here is the person that was offering the sacrifice, they were doing it out of their own free will. They were not being forced. So in the New Testament, in John chapter 10, uh, verse 17 and 18, it says, you don't have to go there, I'll just read it. It says, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my, it was Jesus Christ talking, it says, uh, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. So the person that was actually offering the sacrifice, they were, in, they were doing it out of their own free will. And Jesus Christ, he offered himself, not because he was forced, but he offered it out of his own free will. Now, a statement that you hear is, especially from atheists is that, you know, God is cruel because he sent his one and only begotten son to die for the sins of the world. And that is cruel. But he wasn't, Christ wasn't forced to actually die for our sins. He made, he made the sacrifice. He died for our sins, um, the just for dying, just because uh, he loved us and he did it out of his own free will. He wasn't forced. He laid it down himself. And last thing I want to mention in, um, in this, in like in the burnt offering is, Verse 5, he says, He shall kill the bull before the Lord, and the priests, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So what's happening here is it wasn't the priests that were actually killing the, per like the sacrifice. It was the person that was offering the sacrifice. What the priests would do is they would sprinkle the blood on the altar. So it was the person that killed the offering. So... I heard an interesting uh, explanation of this verse. So a question that a lot of people ask is, you know, who killed Jesus Christ? Um, some say it was the Jews. You know, some say it was the Romans. I mean, if you read your scriptures, you know, it was the Romans that crucified Christ. But we can agree that both the Jews and the Romans were involved in the days of Christ. So we can say both the Jews and the Gentiles are involved. Or we can say humanity was involved in the days of Christ, right? So similar to how... It was the person that was offering the sacrifice that was killing the animal. Humanity killed Jesus, and through that, Jesus Christ atoned for the sins of humanity. So, and yeah, that's a very interesting concept. Um, so yeah, we're going to go to uh, chapter 3, and we're going to see uh, the peace offering. So um, the peace offering, it's found in chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 1 and verses 2. So it says, When his offering is a sacrifice of a peace offering, if he offers it of the herd, whether male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle. And the iron sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood all around on the altar. So there are, as you guys can see from the, the two verses, like there are a lot of uh, similarities between the burnt offering and the peace offering. One is it was supposed to be an animal, like a, from the herd. You know, it was supposed to be um, a bull, a sheep, a goat, or a bird. The bird specifically, like turtle doves, or um, I believe it was pigeons. Um, and then the sacrifice um, was supposed to be without blemish. 
the sacrifice was offered in the tabernacle, it was, and the blood of the sacrifice was supposed to be sprinkled all around uh, the altar. And also the person that was offering the sacrifice, they would put their hands on the animal. So that's the basic uh, overview of uh, the, the peace offering. But there are a lot of differences in between the peace offering and the burnt offering. One is uh, in the peace offering, uh, the sacrifice could be a male or a female. Uh, when we're talking about the peace offering, so in the burnt offering, the animal was supposed to be, like the body of the animal was burnt completely, but in the peace offering, the, it wasn't burnt completely, it was mostly the fat and also the kidneys. Um, but, uh, and the, also the purpose is different. So when we're talking about the peace offering, the peace offering was to have peace with God. It was to have fellowship with God instead of, you know, atoning for our sins. So let's turn our Bibles to uh, Romans 5. Uh, Romans 5, and I'm going to read verse 1. Um, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, and it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So not only are we justified by Christ, but now, because of what Jesus Christ did, we have peace with God. We, because Jesus Christ was our peace offering. We no longer have to like uh, have, offer a sacrifice to actually have peace with God. We no longer have to have a sacrifice in a tabernacle, in a specific location to actually have fellowship with God, to worship God. But we can do that uh, anywhere we are, from any location, uh, because of what Christ did. Now we can have peace with God. And this peace is not going to disappear. You, know, you don't have to like offer a new sacrifice every time because Jesus Christ has already done that. Now And now we have peace. Uh, with God um, and similar to uh, the burnt offering there was a laying of uh, hands in the sacrifice but what Jews actually say is that this laying of hands is different because when they were laying their hands on the animal they were actually worshiping and singing hymns because um, you know this wasn't to atone for the sins it was like to have a peace offering so um, when we go to Colossians chapter 3 Colossians chapter 3, um, verse 15 till 17, and it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called into one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So now, as Christians, we have peace with God. And we also have peace with each other because we are called into one body. We can have fellowship with each other too, and we can have fellowship with God. And when we're talking about having fellowship with God, we don't have to physically offer a sacrifice in a tabernacle, or we don't actually have to come to church to actually worship God. And we're, not, we're not supposed to do it once a week or twice a week in case of this church, but you're actually supposed to worship God. You're supposed to have fellowship with God every, <laughs> every day, like every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And when we're talking about worshiping, you should do it with word and with deed. When we're talking about word, it means prayer, it means singing spiritual songs, it means psalms, it means um, um, hymns, and you can of course be uh, like poems or anything, like anything that's like through our words. And it also has to be with our deeds. Um, when you talk about deeds, like one thing is like loving God with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our minds. And when we're talking about love, biblical love, we're talking about actually showing it with our actions. When we, talk, when we say like a biblical love, we mean um, keeping God's commandments, right? Studying the scripture, evangelizing, serving in church. When we're saying studying the scripture, for example, like we're Christians, we, we Christians usually say, you know, Christianity is not a, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Uh, but like, how can we have a relationship without knowing the person? It's not, it's not possible. And how, what better way is there to know God instead of studying the scripture? So we need to study our scripture, not just reading one or two verses per day, but actually studying the, like, the scripture thoroughly. 
evangelizing. This is something that we Christians ignore. I'm actually guilty of this too, but we should evangelize. Like evangel when we're evangelizing, not only are we worshiping God, but we are actually showing our love for people. Because if we say we love people, then we need to show that um, we, should, we need to show a desire to, for, to have them saved, right? So we need to evangelize. And there's different ways to evangelize. You don't actually have to go out and preach in, in, the, in the streets. You can actually uh, take tracts. Like we have tracts at the end. Like you can take those tracts. You can give them to your families, to your friends, um, to your, um, uh, I'm sorry, to people in your workplaces or to your colleges. Um, another way you can do that, you can use social media if you're afraid to actually talk to people. Or you can even have conversations. You don't actually have to go outside to actually evangelize. There's different ways that we can evangelize. And it's in, in a way that we're worshiping God. We're actually, and also like we're showing love for people. And also serving in church. I mean, you don't actually have to preach here. Like you can worship, lead worship. You can play instruments. You can serve in the media. You can clean. You can actually set up the door, like, sorry, set up the chairs. You can actually uh, worship by giving. There's different ways that you can worship God. It's, we're not like limit because the church is a body and the body has different parts. So um, you, you shouldn't be limited to just worshiping in a single, in single uh, criteria, sorry. Um, so, um, so what are our takeaways for today? Um, so Jesus Christ has done away this, the offerings, the sacrifices. When we're talking about the burnt offering, we don't have to offer a sacrifice to be right with God because Jesus Christ has died for us, the just for the unjust, the, the one without blemish for the one with blemish, right? He died for our sins and he atoned for our sins. And because of what Christ did, now are, not only are we justified, not only do we have righteousness, not only do we have right standing with God, but now because of what Christ did, we have peace with God. We can worship God wherever we are not in a single location, not just coming in church, but we should worship God. We can worship God anywhere we are. We can worship God uh, any days of the week. Like it shouldn't just be, li be limited to just, you know, once a week when we come to church. And another thing is when we're actually studying our scriptures, let's not try to like focus on just ourselves, but let's try to focus on, you know, how it reveals Christ or how it reveals God's character. I mean, it's not a bad thing to focus on ourselves because that's one of the main reasons for um, why the scripture is there to teach us, to teach us moral values so we can apply certain things into our lives. But also when we're studying scripture, we should actually study to see how it reveals God's character, how it reveals um, Christ or how it foreshadows Christ. Because when we're talking about the scripture, like Reddy said earlier, it, it, like the whole of scripture, it's going to be talking about, it talks about Christ. When we're talking about the Old Testament, it points to Christ or it's a foreshadow of Christ. Starting from Genesis 1, when we're talking about Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, in uh, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, they tell us that it was Christ that created the heavens and the earth. When we're talking about the Sabbath in uh, Genesis 2, Jesus Christ says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. He says, come to me who labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Genesis 3, like we covered two weeks ago with wed. Like when, um, Genesis 3, uh, when, when, uh, when the, I'm sorry, um, when uh, God said, you know, um, you will bruise the heel, like the, he said to the serpent, you will bruise the heel and Jesus Christ with the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the animal. That was, just, that is actually reflecting like that is gonna, that was actually foreshadowing Christ and the whole of scripture. When we're talking about the story of Joseph, um, I know we try, we like to apply that to our lives, but that also actually talks about Christ's life. So when we're talking about the old Testament, it actually points to Christ. When we're talking about the new Testament, the gospels, the gospels, they reveal Christ. Um, they talk about the, the life of Christ on this earth, how he died for our sins, how he's perfect, he died for our sins, and how he was resurrected. The epistles, they explain Christ, and Revelation, it expects Christ. So the whole of scripture, it talks about Christ. So when we're studying the scriptures, let's try to, um, let's try to focus on that. Let's try to see how it reveals Christ. Good? <laughs> okay. Um, that's all I have for you guys today. Um, Um, let's, let's pray. So, so let's just meditate on uh, what we learned today. How Jesus Christ became our burn, burnt offering. How he died for our sins.